Thank you, Oscar, and uh, that's okay. You know, California words are a little bit, you know, different. I had a hard time pronouncing Poughkeepsie, Poughkeepsie <laughs> let alone how, know how to spell it, you know. But we'll get better. We got more Asians in Brooklyn and uh, the other places in New York. Well, thank you very much for having me. I have a, just a very little bit of time, so I just want to sort of take advantage of all of you. How many of you were born in, uh, out, of the, out of this country? Raise your hands. How many of you was outside of the country? Okay. How many of you speak another language other than English? Ebonics count too. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's good. How many of you are first generation of your family? Okay. How many of you are first uh, want to graduate from college in your clan? Okay, we've got a good scattering of folks here. Well, I want to thank the Citizen Schools and good afternoon and uh, for putting on this fantastic summit. I think the, uh, the title, uh, Extended Learning Time, is critical and it's important. And I think that um, as an educator for more than 30 years, I know that time is a teacher's and a child's most important resource. Think of this. If time is the only currency a child has right now, and that's all that child has and goes to school on a daily basis, comes home at the end of the day, goes through every week, every month, every school year through the summer. If time is that only currency, and we're responsible for the currency that they come to school with, and we don't give them the return on their investment, is there a lawsuit there? Is there a civil rights issue there? Because I think that if a youngster goes to school, and it's uh, compulsory education too, right? Compulsory education says you're in school, the time from 6 to 16, 10 years. That's average compulsory education, average time that we say our kids go to school. If they don't go to school, they're truants. And if they're truants, then their parents are gone after all because of compulsory education. Now, if a youngster doesn't get anything out of the 10 years, they spend that 10 years, they don't drop out, they don't escape, then, and they get no return on their investment, would that be equivalent to a determinate sentence? And should that child have more than that? And then the question is, does that child have a civil right um, to have equal protection under the Constitution? Because extended learning time is not only about extended learning time in the classroom, it's how we look at time and how we spend it and the assumptions we make on it. And the way that time is spent in this country is pretty dependent upon the zip code that the child lives in, right? Is that equal? So I just wanted to start uh, us start to think about time in a different context other than after school, before school, during school, extended learning time. But the whole concept and the use of time as we look at a child, because everything we structure around schools is supposed to be child-centered. I challenge you to find me a bell schedule that's child-centered, right? If you change the time of the school starting from 7.30 in the morning to 8.30, who do you hear from? Parents, and then who do you hear from? Yeah, right. I tried that once, and it's true. You hear from the parents and the teachers, and they say, what the hell are you doing, Honda? Because I was trying to get the youngsters' educational structure around their biological what is it, a circadic rhythm? <laughs> but we don't. And so, uh, and this is all just theory, right? And this is all just me. But I want us to start thinking about how we look at time, what assumptions we make on the subject, and do we really take the subject in mind when we start looking at research and things like that? I sometimes think um, we do that with the best intentions. 
but sometimes when we're, when we're questioned on it, that we can be challenged on it. So I bring these uh, examples to, hi uh, to highlight the fact that students' learning needs are not often a priority when it comes to decision about how we structure schools, how we structure classrooms, how we structure the year. Think about the school year. We hear often that the school year is about nine months and three months off, and then they say, teachers got their best jobs, man. They're off three months out of the year. Wrong. But where did this structure come from? Anybody? Agrarian? Some of it is agrarian. Most of it is. And some of it is just trying to structure a school year around the best weather in some places. Like Congress leaves D.C. in August because it's too hot <laughs> and it's too humid, right? They were smart. Those colonial guys were not stupid. <laughs> they took that time to go back to their states to plow the land and plant the seeds and start harvesting, or harvest anyways. So the school, annual school year, is a relic of the past. But I don't think we have ever challenged it or stood up to the challenge on behalf of the youngsters. Even when we go year-round schools, it's the same amount of days or the same amount of minutes per day or the same amount of minutes per year. So some states have minimum school, uh, uh, minimum number of minutes per, you know, primary, middle, and high school. And we figure that out. Um, I don't know how, why we did that. But now you are challenging the very basis of why we have kinds of schedules that we have. And you have to do it on behalf of the kids. They deserve nothing less than that. And to stand up to both the, the adult world and say, if you want a child to learn, we know that research says time on task equals better achievement. And so, um, Really, what we're really pushing for in terms of time, more time on task, is the idea of equity of education for each and every child. And that's the principle I would like to leave you with. In anything that you do in terms of policy or structures or research, how does the principle of equity for each and every child play into the things that I'm trying to do for my kids? because we know that time on task does make a difference. We also know that equity has to play a part in it because equity means not every child is equal. That a child coming starting school in kindergarten, all children at kindergarten do not start at the same spot. If they did, if that were the case, Half our battles be over with, but they don't. We know that. And so how do you achieve equity for each and every child, looking at each child not starting at the same place? You know, how do you build equity into their educational life and school year and school uh, academic career until they reach a point where they can compete on an equitable basis? To me, that's the key. You don't start at the fifth grade. You know, a lot of times we say STEM, you know, we're going to start STEM projects at fifth and sixth grade level because we need more women and minorities in the classroom, in the, in the field. Yeah, when we look at the preschool up to fourth and fifth grade, that's where they get eliminated. And yet they come to school, preschool and kindergarten, with the joy of learning, the joy and the curiosity of learning, and somewhere along the line, we school them. Not, you know, the other word. So well, we have to sit back and start to think exactly what is it that we assume in our public education system and think about the principle, excellence for an equity in education for each and every child. So that means how do we assess them, how do we look at them, how do we get them started, how we develop their program. We know it's gonna be a lot of money. And I heard the last panel, some guy said, we can't go cheaps. He's right. 
but you can't also depend upon the 50 states to do it either. Because since the civil rights movement, we started to understand that there's an issue of equality in terms of our civil rights. Then when we look at our schools, there was an issue of separate but equal, separate but unequal, and we said that's wrong. And so we had a fight between the states and the feds, and the feds won. The feds had to inter intervene at states' rights level because the states were not doing what they're supposed to do, providing equal protection for everyone in this country. And in terms of public education, they're maintaining there's a state's constitutional responsibility, but 50 states are not on equal footing. So they have to be challenged in terms of equitable funding, equitable distribution of resources by each child. So when we start to implement that, then we can start figuring out the road to equity for each and every child. I hope that makes sense. So what do we do on a daily basis? Keep our keep our our vision and our, our scope set on that whole concept of equity and education for each and every child. How do we get there in terms of allocation of time? We may have to take our paradigm and shift it out and step outside of the paradigm and look at everything differently. And I mentioned the civil rights movement of fifties. The only reason there was a lot of success quickly, quickly I mean in a, well, a decade or so, it was because of technology. What was happening in the southern states and the kids who were fighting for their uh, equal rights and the community fighting for the equal rights, we saw on TV. It brought into our living rooms what states were doing to these communities. They were fighting, and they were being civilly disobedient, and they were being put down in the name of the rights of the states. And now we're at another epoch where technology collapses time and distance to almost zero. And we start to look at equity for each and every child in public education in order for them to achieve the equality that they need in order to be able to compete. So every other pilot program, every other thing that comes up, even though it's successful, cannot be and will not be scaled up on a national level because we have all these barriers in the way. So some of that extended learning time we have to put in ourselves and start thinking about what it is that we need to do for the sake of the child. And it doesn't matter where they live. It really doesn't matter what zip code they live in because the principle of each and every child's equity and their educational equity assumes every child. It doesn't, mean, doesn't matter what zip code they live in. And so this is a challenge. It's a civil rights challenge. It's an educational challenge for all of us in terms of looking at the time that we spend every day that we should be spent towards that goal of equity for each and every child and how we, how we put that time to use for them so that they can achieve the American dream. And that's um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that they, we apply the protection of the Constitution to them so that that promise really becomes real. And I think that once we do that, We'll be on our way, and we'll see a lot of changes. But technology, your understanding of time, and hanging on to that principle of educational excellence for each and every child will get us there. And I want to thank you for your work in this area, your daily struggles to make the changes. And when we pull it together, uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. It's in our American character to make it work so that children from Appalachia to Beverly Hills, from Austin, Texas, and uh, La Betra, 
over up to the northern states of Montana, that all the children will have the equal uh, opportunity through the concept of equity. And we take care of each one of them. I appreciate it. Thank you.